Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you all here. We've got uh, folks who are live here in, uh, in the classroom. We've got folks online through Zoom. And also we want to give our greetings to those who are joining us by YouTube later on after the fact. Um, some of the videos, some of the Bible study videos have uh, 30, 40 views after the fact. So I feel like, okay, people are watching. So hi, people who are watching. That's great. Uh, you're tuning in to the deep dive Bible study into the book of Genesis here at uh, New Beginnings Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. Tonight is November 16th, Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. Uh, it's been a cold day. There's been some snow, which has been nice. Uh, I, I was telling my secretary, Rachel, today, I was telling, telling her that uh, for me, the first snow of the season is kind of like smelling popcorn popping. I'm really excited, even though I know it'll be disappointing later on. Um, but I like I like getting some snow. So that's, I know that I'll, I'll eventually grow tired of the snow and hope it stops. But right now, I'm, I'm thrilled to see the white stuff out there. Um, if you are joining us by YouTube and you need the manuscript and notes for this Bible study, send an email to church at newbeginningscma.org, and we'll send you all the information we got. For this class. Um, yeah, let's pray and we'll dig into our passage tonight. Lord God, thanks for this evening. Thanks for this chance for us to be together, to enjoy studying the scriptures together. Lord, I pray that you will bless our time tonight. Um, tonight's passage is the kind of passage where if you don't show up, it's not going to be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So, Lord, it's in your hands. This Bible study is in your hands. Uh, there's not much I can do to make it interesting. So, uh, please, Lord, uh, send your Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. And just as you inspired this passage to be written so many years ago, uh, Lord, now as we read it and study it, I pray that you inspire the, the reading of it and, the, and the, uh, the interpretation of it as we go through. In Jesus' name. All right, well, our, our, we're studying the book of Genesis, and in our manuscript, we're on page 65, line 1. 60, page 65, line 1. And uh, if again, if you're on YouTube and you're using our manuscript, it might be on a, uh, a different line because the, the newer manuscript that we're using uh, has a different uh, line numbering. But it's going to be around page 65, line 1. And it starts with, these are the generations of Esau. That's what we're starting with tonight. Uh, now that actually appears twice in our passage, so it's the first one that we're looking that we're starting at. Um, the the big question that we always start off with here in the class is, where should our passage end? Where should our passage end? So, does anyone have you if you've had a chance to study it in advance? Um, where do you think this passage should break off for our study tonight? I went to page 66, line 14. Page 66, line 14. Uh, chief by chief in the land of Seir. It takes us through three genealogies. Um, that's a good, a good place to end. It starts with, in the next passage, we'll start off then with these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom. So it goes from sons to chiefs and, and breaks off before it goes to kings. Um, does anybody have a different place? I got page 67, line 5. Page 67, line 5. Yeah. According to the dwelling places in the land of their possession. Right. Um, right, right there. It starts off on Jacob. So it starts off on Jacob. Ends, ends Esau, it starts off on Jacob. Okay. That would include all four genealogies that are in this section of the, of the Bible. Yeah, so I, I, I told you, you know, I, did, I, can, I can chop it up, I can season it, but it's, it's not, a, not a very tender hunk of meat, let's put it that way. Boiled chicken and boiled chicken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I initially had that, and that, that was initially my ending point, but I actually added the next sentence uh, before I finished my studies, because I believe that uh, the end of line five, beginning of line six, just before a new Toledot actually uh, 
helps us to understand why this passage exists in the first place. So I'm going to say, let's end it on page 67, line six, in the land of Canaan period, just before these are the generations of Jacob. All right, well, let's keep that one sentence in. Now, I just gave you a big spoiler. I think that in order to understand the passage, we need that one line, which tells you a lot about the passage, right? It's, it, there's a lot of stuff that kind of, that's the punchline. Um, so let's dig in. Our, our, uh, our three-point uh, approach to studying the scriptures is to look, to listen, and to live. So we start by looking, observing in the passage, what are the things that we can see in the passage? Um, what are the things that uh, we pray for God's insight? We, we want to look with God's eyes, but we want to also see what, what are the human author of this passage? Um, and I you know, would usually say who we assume to be Moses, but we got some questions about that in this passage. Uh, uh, what, what did the author of this passage intend for us to get from the passage? Why did they write it down? Um, they didn't just waste manuscript parchment in those days, right? It, it, was, it, it was something that was very valuable. They didn't just write for the sake of writing. Why did they write include this in the passage? Why is this important? And why did God inspire them to keep it as part of this passage? That's so we're going to look for that um, you, through our observation. Kind of see, okay, what do we see? Why is this passage important? So let me ask you this. Actually, we're going to do this. We'll take five minutes before we start off. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to look over the passage, I want you to get a chance to, to study it. I, I studied it for a few hours today. Um, and uh, at least having familiarity with the passage would be really, really helpful. So I want to give you five minutes uh, on your own to look it over, and then we will come back together and we will uh, talk about what we're seeing. So uh, if you're using the YouTube uh, version of this Bible study, hi, Janet, good to see you, Janet. If we're using, you're using the, the YouTube version of this, uh, of this Bible study, uh, I'm gonna sit down in the chair and when I stand back up, that'll be five minutes, okay? I guess this is not five minutes yet, but I'll just say this. If, if you haven't read the passage yet, here's the problem with the passage. It's almost entirely names of people from another culture and other time. It's really easy for your eyes to glaze over. I'm going to tell you this. The best parts of the passage uh, are the names. Okay? So definitely try not to let your your eyes glaze over that's all
All right. Well, um, I'm going to do you a couple of favors. You can thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favor number one. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give you a couple handles on which to hang this passage. Okay. First off, first thing you should notice is that there are four genealogies in this passage. Okay. It's, there's, there's four chunks of genealogy. One is from 65 line one, where we started, to 65 line 10. Okay. So I'm going to call that one G1, genealogy one. That's uh, 65 one to 65 10. Okay. These are the generations of Esau. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. Uh, so Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Okay, so find eleven. Which, sorry, that's, that's genealogy number one. Okay, genealogy number two starts in line eleven. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir, and it goes to page sixty-six, line four. Okay, so G2 is 6511 to 66, what did I say? Four? Yeah, four. Um, up to chiefs, right? Uh, these are the sons of Esau, and these are their chiefs. Uh, then it starts with these are the sons of Seir the Horite. Okay, and it gives the gem genealogy of Seir the Horite. That goes from line four on page 66 to line 14. Okay, so G3 is from line 66 to four to 14. And then there's a fourth genealogy, which I'll call G4. I know it's a shocking. Uh, from 66, 15, all the way, and I'm gonna say it goes through. Um, uh, 67 line five. Okay, so if you're if if you're like me, what I what I did was I put a box around each genealogy or a bracket on the side and said G1, G2, G3, G4. So I can see, okay. So it has some sort of a manageable something, right? It's not just a mass of names. There's actually a movement in the passage from genealogy to genealogy. That's the first favor I'm going to do you. Okay. Um, the second favor I'm going to do you, I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a a reading from uh, a really a decent, I'd say, decent commentary. I haven't read any commentary to you yet in the book of Genesis. Um, I have four commentaries that I use as I'm preparing for the study. Um, and I would say out of the four, this one is the third best. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's occasionally useful. Uh, I usually come to it third and I find that he's just saying a lot of things that everybody else is saying. And uh, I don't feel like he's got a lot of insights. Sorry, Kent Hughes. Uh, this guy, R. Kent Hughes, is the is the professor who taught one of my closest friends, and he, my close friend works with him and goes around preaching with him. He's an excellent preacher, Kent Hughes is. But as far as his Genesis commentary goes, I would say it's not all that wonderful. It's not bad, but it's just he doesn't doesn't ring my bells. But he's got a section on Esau, which I think is really helpful here. Um, and now this is. This is background. None of this will help you with this passage necessarily, but it might help you with understanding Esau a little bit. Um, he's been going on and saying, in the, in the commentary up to this point, he's been going on in this chapter and saying, okay, um, was Esau always a bad guy? Like Esau, he's objecting to Esau being called a villain, right? It's, Esau's not a villain. Esau started, Esau was kind of a man's man starting out, kind of. You know, the, the hunter everybody liked, and he, he liked everybody, and he enjoyed his food, and he enjoyed women, and he enjoyed, you know, the, the outdoor life. He, you've known people like Esau all your life, right? We, we meet people 
like this who are just really charming and, and a lot of fun and um, and who live in the moment, right? Rather than looking to the future. Um, and Esau made some really bad decisions early on and got so angry that he threatened to kill his brother. Definitely a bad thing. But we also saw in this Bible study that Esau comes around, right? Esau forgives Jacob generously and, you know, and he, he seems to be pretty chill uh, by the time we, we, we meet him again 20 years later. But I love this, but, but Ken Hughes says here, he says this, my point is that Genesis is ambiguous about Esau. The beginning of his life was certainly graceless, but he appeared as a different man after the 20 year hiatus. Certainly his demotion from covenant bearer did not mean he was excluded from the benefits of the covenant. Personally, I've seen the pattern and ambiguities of Esau's chronicle trusted and uh, traced in the lives of men I've buried over the years. They were born to godly though imperfect parents. Growing up, they were nurtured and catechized in God's word, but Christian things meant little to them. Heaven was far off, disconnected from real life, and as they matured, they came to despise their heritage, maybe not overtly, but by neglect and dismissiveness. Some were ignorant despisers, some were cultured despisers. To their parents' great sorrow, they married outside the faith and then went with the flow of culture in raising their children so that they became de facto pagans, pursuing and even atten at attaining the American dream. But as these men passed through midlife, the emptiness of it all began to pummel their souls. They repented and came to faith. When they could, they made amends, but their families did not follow. So these men stayed at the fringes of the church, sometimes seeking counsel, engaging in benevolences, pretending irregularly and alone, and inarticulate as to their faith. When they died, their family asked for a funeral in the church in respect to their father's wishes. And when I preached, it was to ignorant, unbelieving hearts. They were Edomites. One of the things that I just think is important to, for me to remember as a pastor is that not every Christian is like me. I'm a Bible nerd. I love this stuff. I, I live for it. You know, uh, I'm happy to spend every day studying the scriptures. It's what I do and then teaching it. Um, but I always like that. Right. And I grew up in the church. I grew up with, uh, you know, where, where the life of the church was something I was constantly involved in. That's not how everybody grows up. And it's not how everybody and works or how someone grows up isn't necessarily how they end up. Right, and the, and so Esau is a complicated guy, and we all kind of know Esau's in our life. Um, and maybe you know, maybe you're an Esau if you're on YouTube. Uh, maybe maybe you you're someone who's come to the faith late in life, um, and you feel like, oh, you know, I, I wish my my earlier life had been different, but but that's who I am. Right, that's where I've been. So anyway, that's a little gift. I thought it was a, it was a gift to me today when I read it. So I thought I'd read it for you. Those are my two favors I give you now. Now we now we talk about the passage. Okay, so um, let's stay in G one to start. What are some things you saw in G one? Esau took Cain, uh, his wives from Canaan. Okay, so we have Esau marrying Canaanites. It is not new for us, right? Um, Esau married Canaanites, Canaanite women. That just sounds kind of like a factual statement, but in Genesis, it's not. It's not just a factual statement. And we talked about this a couple of, of passages ago uh, when Jacob, uh, uh, when uh, Dinah was raped and when the men of Shechem wanted to intermarry with Israel, that that is like a major red flag, right? That, uh, the, 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 the line of God's promise had been uh, trying to avoid intermarrying um, and, uh, and uh, because it was important to them to keep the faith, right? Well, Esau marries Canaanite women, probably pagan women, right? And, uh, and this, this please, we remember back on page 44, page 48, uh, that um, this displeased his parents. His parents weren't happy about it. Yeah. Very good. 
Um, now, two of them are, are, are Canaanites. One of them is an Ishmaelite, right? Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, is a Canaanite. Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, they're both Canaanites. And Basimoth, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth, is an Ishmaelite. So she is, she is more acceptable, I think, to uh, his parents, David. Uh, one interesting thing to note, and maybe, maybe you saw this, maybe you didn't, but I didn't see it, is that if you go back to page 44 and page 48, well, let's go back to page 44 and 48, because there's not a lot of interesting things in this passage, so let's take advantage. Page 44. Um, page 44, line 23. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he took, ooh, what's the number of Beery that he took? Judith, the daughter of Beery, the Hittite. Let's look back at 65. Not there. Okay. He does marry a Hittite, A to the daughter of Elon, but those are different names. Okay, let's go back to page 45. Uh, he took uh, Judith, Judith, daughter of Beery the Hittite, to be his wife, and as Basimoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Okay. Um, let's go back to 65. She is there, Basimoth, but here she's an Ishmaelite. Uh, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Nebaioth. That's different. Okay, let's go to page 48. Esau's parents are upset that he took uh, Canaanite wives. So in page 48, line 16, uh, Esau went to Ishmael and took as his wife beside the wives he had. Halak, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Go back to page 65 where we're, we're starting. He is not there. Uh, this is one of those places where I got, I got nothing for you. Um, there have been a lot of attempts over the years to try to map one name onto the other between when they're first introduced and here. Uh, it's, it's, it's pointless. There's no way to make it work. Um, I, I don't think there's any way to make it work. Um, something has happened to the text, and I don't know what it is. Um, this is a place where I can't tell you what the real names of, of Esau's wives were. What I can tell you is that uh, these names are meaningful, but not that meaningful. It's like it's not like it's not like they have names that sort of are zinger names that will. Uh, will you know, that the author is using to make a point. Um, there is a commonality in that last one that saying that uh, the per that person was the sister of Nebaioth, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. Person. It's not the same name, and Basimoth right. uh, in, in in the earlier passage is a Hittite. Right. So it's, 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 I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what happened, um, but somewhere along the line, this got broke. Maybe the whole point is just. How many wives did he have? They're not important. They so, you, doesn't matter. so you could say that maybe he had more wives than this, but here in the genealogy, uh, yeah, we just keep naming names. What else are they going to ask? Well, well, look, there's more. There is there is structure to it. So, so it's not just random. But yeah, I mean, it's I don't know how to make this work, and I so I'm, I'm sorry. It, uh, I've read many many commentaries on this, and there's just no there's just no good answer. Oh well. But they bear him children. Now, within this story here on page 65, they are consistent. Okay, so they're consistent here within the story. Whether they're not consistent with the earlier mention, but they are consistent here. Each one of them bears him kids. Um, now, we've talked about genealogies in the past. Um, we've talked about the fact that there are two kinds of genealogies that don't involve owls. Uh, one is a linear genealogy. A linear genealogy says, you know, X begat Y begat Z, right? It 
the line. And oftentimes the end of a linear genealogy will break off and your you know, Z begat A, B, and C. Okay. We saw this kind of genealogy in Genesis chapter 10. We saw it in Genesis chapter 5. Um, a linear genealogy that breaks off at the end is pretty typical for the book of Genesis. But there's another kind of genealogy that's not a linear genealogy, and I don't have a name for it. Well, the other kind. Of one. <laughs> uh, where it's like, you know, here's, uh, here, I'll just pick a name at random Esau, uh, you know, married. Bazimoth and Bazimoth had these three kids, right? And then he married uh, Holy Mama and she had these three kids, right? Or whatever. Um, this is a very different kind of, and then you start following, okay, this kid has these kids, you know, family tree kind of genealogy. Yes. Yes. So you have a tree tree. Yeah. Uh, we've now christened it. Chris Rigelwood. <laughs> uh, it's a, uh, so this is the kind of genealogy that we're in. Okay, that's got we've got a, we've got a lot of genealogy going on here. We see some linear genealogies in our passage too, but uh, but in G one we're dealing with a with a nonlinear genealogy. It's not it's not just giving us one person at each generation or stage. I, I have a question. Yay, could, could the first two women that he married have been totally barren and then he married the other ones? Sure. Your guess is as good as mine, right? Uh, that's, 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 a, that's a situation in which we just don't have enough story to tell us, right? They could have been barren. Maybe they died. Uh, maybe these are different women. Maybe they're the same women, but they had nicknames. Maybe their dads had nicknames. You know, there's not, there's, the only, only answers I can give you would be speculation. And, and nobody has, nobody has any evidence to back up speculation. That's all it can be is speculation. So, right. So I trust the Lord. I trust the Holy Spirit. I trust that this that this is that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. I trust that it is inerrant as originally given, which is what's in our statement of faith, right? Um, so uh, all those things I trust and here I hit a rock and I'm like, I can't explain it. I believe it's inerrant. I believe it was inerrant when it was originally written, but I don't know what happened. And I don't have enough evidence to, to, to answer. You, it, those are very good speculation, Bev, and it could very well be true. Um, but I, I don't know how to find out. You have to go back in a time machine and, and, uh, and talk to Esau to, to really figure it out. Um, very good. You see anything else? What else did you see? What are the, let's, let's, we got to deal with one thing. The very first words in our passage is, these are the generations of Esau. What is that? These are the generations of Esau. Descendants. What is that? Descendants. Okay, now this phrase is an important phrase. We've seen it now five times previously. These are the generations of Adam and Eve. These are the generations of the earth when it was created. These are the generations of Noah. It's a toledote. Yes. Okay, so T O L E D O T, a Toledot. Uh, what we've said is that Toledot is a Hebrew word. It's it's the Hebrew word that's there for generations. A Toledot is a it's a formulaic way of sort of introducing a section of the Book of Genesis. Um, the Book of Genesis has ten or eleven Toledots. Most times when you count the Toledots. You'll take both of them that are on page 65 as one because it doesn't make the, the second Toledot doesn't make any sense. Um, so uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, these are the generations of Esau. There's going to be another one. These are the generations of Esau on line uh, 11. Um, but this is, we, we, we said that this is kind of the, the structure on which the book of Genesis is built. We called it a chapter heading for the book of Genesis. Uh, 
although they're not of equal length, they're in fact of vastly unequal lengths. When we get to the, the, the Toledote that starts the next passage for our next class, that one starts a, a section that lasts for the entire rest of the book. Uh, no, almost. Um, it's huge. It's, it's like 20 chapters long. So, you know, it's not, it's not evenly spaced. But here we have one of those sort of pillars of the book of Genesis. Very good. Thank you again for coming up with the word. Well, all right. Uh, anything else? What else have you noticed here in generation genealogy one? Well, they had to move away to a different land to get away from, from Jacob. And uh, what did that remind you of? Um, what do you think about? They had to, they couldn't dwell together. Their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. So they separated. Does that remind you of any stories in the book of Genesis? Abraham and Lot. Yeah, right. So this is, a, this is, a, a, it's mirrored by the Abraham and Lot, a mirror of the Abraham and Lot story. In the Abraham and Lot story, what happened that convinced them that they needed to separate? They both had too much wealth to support the two big herds and stuff. Yeah, so, they, so the same thing here. What what is it that what was the inciting event that caused them to separate? That that's the facts, the base facts. Possession. They they had too much possessions. Conflict. Abraham's guys and Lot's guys had conflict. Their their herdsmen came into conflict. They were constantly coming into conflict, and so they separated. We don't see that here at all, right? They just decide to separate, um, which I think is at least a little hint that. Relations between Esau and Jacob were better than relations between Lot and Abraham. Very good. Um, I thought they weren't. Hmm? When did they fight? Who? Esau and Jacob. They did. They did. When, when they came back together, when Esau and Jacob came back together after 20 years, he saw through his arms around Jacob yeah. and hugged him, kissed him, and said, "You're my brother." Yeah, but in the beginning, he took his birthright. Oh yeah. I didn't think they separated amicably at all. Not back in uh, in page forty four. Yeah. But but here, but but when when they when they re but here when they're separating right here in line ten, uh, line nine and ten, uh, when Jacob and Esau are separating from each other. Here, oh, okay. it's not happening. There's so this no is plan. happening now. Yes, I thought this was a history of what happened oh, oh, from good, the beginning. Good question. No, this is this is a is in the middle of this genealogy. There's a story. It says, okay, okay now Esau did these things. Okay. Um, Esau had five sons in the land of Canaan. Um, also had daughters. It says in line six, although we don't get any of their names. Um, and. Here we go. Ready? My daughter said, at least you get to read crazy names. <laughs> Ada, line four. Um, Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz. Eliphaz, son number one, first one, right? Basimah bore Ruel, son number two. Holabama bore Jeush, Jalam, and Korah, three, four, and five. So we have five sons of Esau. Okay? Put that in the bank. We have five sons of Esau. I'm just going to arbitrarily say there's not a lot more that we can see in gene genealogy one. If you've got something that's hot on your heart from gene gene genealogy one, let me know. But I think you've seen most of the important stuff there. Um, so let's move to genealogy two. Genealogy two starts with what? These are the generations of Esau, the following the Edomites. So we have, we have Toledot, number two in this passage. And Esau is the father of the Edomites. Now, in, in the first genealogy, he's, it says these are the descendants of Esau, that is Edom. So notice how often in our passage, Esau and Edom are mentioned together, right? That the author wants you to never forget that Esau 
is the father of the Edomites. Esau is in fact called Edom, just like Jacob is called Israel, right? Uh, Edom is his national name. It's the name that is going to be the name of the nation that will come uh, from him. At the end of the previous genealogy, it says in parentheses, Esau is Edom, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. We get again, the five sons are listed again, right? Eliphaz, the son of Edith, the wife of Esau, Rule, the son of Basimuth, the wife of Esau. And wait, there's only two wives. Where did Holobamba go? Where did Holobamba go? Can you find her? Yeah. Where? The sons of Holobamba. Where? Uh, 18. 918. Okay, Holobama gets shuffled off to the end. Oh, yeah, because I could stick in the middle. Why did you do that? The concubines. Yeah, so, there's, there's, that. so the, the two Hittite wives, uh, the two Hittite wives, the two Canaanite wives get pulled together. And Holobama, the, who in, in this telling of it, is, uh, no, I'm sorry, you're right. So Basimuth actually is. The, is, is a Hittite. So you're, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting confused here. He pulls Ada and Basimuth together mm -hmm. and gives us their genealogies. And then, uh, and then he only then does he come back to a holy Baba. So we get Eliphaz, son number one, again in line 12. We get Rule, son number two, in line 13. And then we have the second generation of sons from Esau. So we have Esau's grandson. This is what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, let's give me the names of Esau's grandsons to from Eliphaz. Okay, so Eliphaz, Esau's firstborn, bears. Say again. Timon. 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 T i m a n. Omar. Omar. Yeah. Zepho. Zepho. No. Zepho. Oh, Zepho. Not one of the Marx brothers. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Timon. Timon. Omar. Zepho. Datum or Datum. D a t a n. A m. Yeah. Datum. Okay. Hina. 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 Okay, so we have we have five: Timon, oh, okay. Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kina. Sam and Alan. Well, uh, uh, no, well, she was born in the continent. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, um, so Amalek is off is separated out. Amalek is born of a concubine. Okay. He would be son number six in this list, but he is for some reason separated out. Let's put a pin in it and ask later we'll ask why is Amalek separated out. Okay. But how many sons to Eliphaz that are born to his natural wives? Five. Five. Okay. All right. Then, then we go on and we give the sons of Rule, who is Ellen, who is uh who is rule? I told you this is not easy stuff. Basimuth's son. Okay. So it is Basimuth's son rule. Okay. He gives us, she gives us, he gives us how many grandsons? Four. Okay. And what are their names? Just because I'm a son. What the fuck? Naha. Okay. Zera. Z E R A A H. Shamara. S H E M A N M A N A. M -M -A. Okay, come on. H. Okay, and one more. Mizan. M I Z Z A N. I don't have these memorized. So, yeah. All right, so we have four. Um, and then we pick up the sons of Aholibama. Now, these are not Esau's grandsons. 
okay? These are Esau's sons, okay? But they're listed with the grandsons for some reason, okay? So who are Holabama's sons? J-U-S-H, okay. Jalam. J-A-L-A-M. Yep. Or which were mentioned earlier up in yeah, they were. Line yeah. one, two, three, four, five. They were the previous they genealogy. Are. But for some reason, they're listed here with the grandsons. How many of them? Three. Okay. Five plus four plus three equals. Okay. All right. This is, you got it. So any, any, got it in one. Okay. okay. The reason that the author mixes all this up, the reason he, the, the reason the author gives us a list of grandsons and then shuffles a whole Obama's three kids off to the end and, and sequesters Amalek over on the side from the concubine is so that we can get 12 tribes of Esau. Okay. Um, it's supposed to remind you of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So, and eventually the 12 disciples, yes. But <laughs> in Genesis, it's going to be the 12 tribes. And Ishmael earlier had 12 sons, right? So, so we have we have the other son of the promised child um, having a, a, a 12 tribes, just like the promised son did, right? Now, there's a specific word that's used here in line 19 for these people, for these 12. These 12, they're not called grandsons and sons, chiefs. They're called chiefs, okay? So, so genealogy one is concerned with Esau's sons. Genealogy two is concerned with the chiefs of the sons of Esau. So we've now made a, a step from sons to chiefs. What does so why what does chief mean? Why is it important that these guys are chiefs? Heads of clans. They're the heads of clans. Okay, they are tribal leaders. So Esau has made the Edom has made the transition from being just a family to being a a bunch of tribes. Okay, so we're seeing that happen in Edom. Okay, uh, then we go through uh, another list, right? And they're all they're all there again, right? Um, and they're listed there. Now, why Amalek? Let's let's just take a, a second and ask about Amalek here, because Amalek is sequestered out as the son of a concubine, but the name Amalek is important in Israelite history. Amalekite. Amalek is the father of the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites turn out to be Israel's most persistent enemy. Okay, um, they're going to be bad guys for a long time. And later in the book of Genesis, God is going to tell earlier in the book of Genesis. Earlier in the book of Genesis, God told Abraham that his, his descendants would be slaves in the land of Egypt for 400 years, he said because the sins of the Amalekites have not yet reached their full measure. Amalek wasn't even born when God said that to Abraham, okay? Uh, it's not till two generations later that Amalek is, or three generations later that Amalek is born, and Amalek becomes the father of the Amalekites who are going to be notoriously sinful. And it's because of the Amalekites, because God is having patience on the Amalekites, that the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. Okay? Ah! <laughs> Here we go, right? Weird stuff. 
incidentally, um, there is a character in the Old Testament uh, who is basically, we call him the Old Testament's Adolf Hitler. Okay? He is a character in the Old Testament who is an enemy of Israel who uh, works to uh, pass a law that will mean the eradication of every Israelite uh, at that time in the in the in the Babylon the, the, the Babylonian in the Babylonian kingdom. Oh, I'm wrong. It's not Babylonian. It's in the kingdom that he was serving, and uh, his name is is Haman. Haman the Agagite. Okay, it's called Haman the Agagite, and uh, we learn from um, Josephus, the Israelite historian from the first century, who talked about Jesus and John the Baptist, a very interesting guy. Um, but he tells us that Haman the Agagite was an Amalekite, that Agag was one of the sons of Amalek. Um, so Haman, who is the worst, the worst guy in the Old Testament, Haman is an Amalekite. So this is, this, this is the origin of the Amalekites here, is with this dude. All right. I'm going to have mercy on you, and we're going to move fast here through uh, this uh, this genealogy, and we will skip through the retelling of the names of the chiefs. Um, there are some little differences between the names of the chiefs uh, in lines, um, uh, page 65, lines uh, 13 through 19, and the retelling of them in lines 19 through uh, page 66, line three. There's some discrepancies there. They're not major. Um, there's some spelling differences, but they're, they're generally the same people. Although it is funny, if, if you take the time, slow down and, and look at it carefully. I mentioned before, right? Uh, when I did the sermon on, um, on the reliability of the New Testament, I, I mentioned that uh, spelling was not regularized. It is just a ton of fun. Um, uh, no, it's a minor fleck of fun in a whole school of work. If you take these names and, and really drill into them, you'll see that the spellings of these names actually changes in the same passage, right? Same guy, same person. You, you, you tell where they are in the genealogy and their name is spelled differently in two different places, you know, less than four inches away from each other. Um, so that's, that's where I get my fun. Mm -hmm. That's why I am who I am. Okay. All right, so then we get to genealogy number three, page 66, line uh, four and following. These are the sons of Seir the Horite. Who is he? The inhabitants of the land. These are the people who lived, genealogy three is the people who lived in the land when Esau moved in. Okay. Esau's folks, they come. So this is the genealogy of the Canaanites. There's no Toledos there. Right? It's, this is not the line of the promise. It's not a major chapter heading here. This is where we're getting the names of the of the Canaanites that are there. Um Maybe it's not really explained to us, but they live in the land of Seir. Now we've we've noted before that Seir is the land where he, where Esau moves his family. A couple of things about this, and I'll just teach them to you, and I'm not going to ask you to look at it carefully. A um, couple of things about this is that Lotan on um, line seven of page 66. Lotan's sister was Timna. Yes, okay, good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, Esau's son, Eliphaz, marries a, a Canaanite. Okay? Um, it's, it happens as kind of a trickle. By the end of our passage, it's a flood. Okay? intermarrying with the Canaanites starts off small, but it winds up really big. Timna is, uh, is the concubine from whom Amalek comes. Um, and 
she's the sister of Lotan. Um, I know that all of you are pinching yourselves and saying, I wish I had named my son Lotan. It's just such an interesting <laughs> name. But no, we all missed it out. We all missed out. There is a little vignette here in line nine, a little break from the names. It explains to us, which is really helpful, that Aina is the guy who found the hot springs in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of Zibi and his father, which is a story that doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. And I don't know who that is, but he found hot springs while he was pasturing the donkeys. Okay, maybe this is a story that was known, I guess, to the people of the day, I guess. One of the <laughs> one, of the things we, one of the things we don't actually know is what he found while he was pasturing the donkeys. The English Standard Version translates the, the Hebrew word there, hot springs. If you read other translations, it will say mules. They read other translations, it says vipers. It makes me think that they tell you who this Ana is because there must be another one. Yeah, well, it's like, who is he compared to? The Aina that I guess everybody would know. Maybe, yeah, maybe. But we all know. But, but, but I assume that they knew that there was an Aina who found hot springs or donkeys or vipers yeah. or mules or vipers. Uh, and so, so they, they put it in there. That, that is a Hebrew word that's only used once in the Bible and we don't find it anywhere else in any literature. So like there's, there's literally no, no way that we can figure out what it means other than comparing it to words in other languages. And so when we compare it to words in other languages that are from around there, some other languages sound like hot springs, some other languages sound like uh, mules, and some sounds like vipers. Uh, that's really everything interesting in there that I got for you. The, the last, oh no, I'm sorry, two other interesting things. And again, interesting is maybe a stretch. Uh, notice that there is a direct repetition from line four to line 12. These are the sons of, uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, these are the sons of, these are the sons of is there as a direct repetition. He gives the list, right? And then he gives some, uh, some uh, additional names. He, he then comes in and says, okay, here's more, son, here, here's more sons. We have lots of sons. One of the sons in line 12, and near the end of line 12 is named Uz. Another name. So you could have named your first one, but you did not. Uz. U Z. Almighty and powerful Uz. Um, somebody on YouTube is going to get that. Uh, all right. So Uz, Uz shows up somewhere else in the Bible. Okay, Uz shows up in Job chapter one. Job lives in the land of Uz. Okay, so this is why we believe that the book of Job is written about a person who lived during this era because he, was, he lived in the land of Uz and that's really the only reference we have there. Okay, now we get to something that I actually think is very interesting. On the scale of zero to ten, okay, this is probably a seven. Okay, so we're we're at a real is I would say this is really interesting. Okay, we start into genealogy four in line fifteen of page sixty six. Um, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. What is difficult about that line? For any king reign over the Israelites. This is this is a biblically difficult line. The timing is off. Backwards. Well, let me ask you this. No, no, they were setting up their kingdoms because later on down the road. I mean, Still had uh, every city king. Okay, that's not that's not what I'm thinking about. Um, let me I'll, I'll throw a, 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 
bringer question out at you. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Moses. When Moses looks back over Israelite history, there are no kings, okay? So, Moses has no knowledge of kings in Israel, okay? But here it says, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the Israelites. Whoever wrote that line knows that Israel eventually had kings, okay? Now we've been saying throughout this class that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. This line requires us to back up and say most of the book of Genesis, okay? There must have been an editor later on who uh, put this line in here because Moses could not have written it. Now, uh, you will find Christian scholars who will say Moses wrote it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so he could write things that he didn't know about. Okay, I suppose it's possible. I think a more, a more reasonable explanation is that um, Moses wasn't the last person to touch the book of Genesis, right? At, at some point along the line, somebody decided that uh, we needed here, after a list of sons, and after a list of chiefs of Edom, we need a list of kings. Okay. So we had a we had a, a genealogy of sons, we had a genealogy of chiefs, and we had a genealogy of kings. Um why is that important? This is where Sue's answer and Chris's answer come in. Um, the Edomites went through the same transitions as the Israelites did, but they did it faster. Okay? Uh, if you look through the list of kings, there are eight generations of kings uh, before the Israelites had their first king. So Edom had been a kingdom for, let's say, conservatively, eight times four is 24, 32, thank you. 320 years, uh, give or take, giving, giving a 40 year reign to each king, which is just a guess. Uh, 300 or so years prior to Israel having their first king. Um, Edom prospered, Edom grew, Edom became powerful long before Israel did. Okay. Um, we sort of have this impression that uh, if you're good and you do good things, if you follow God, that you will prosper. Right? Israel did prosper. God promised prosperity to Israel, and eventually they did. They became mighty. Um, but Edom, um, Amalek, uh, the, the Hittites, there's another one uh, that we, we didn't talk about, but um, uh, the Temanites, yes, that is a good, the Temanites, oh, that's, that's down on line 13, there's, there's one more. Uh, the, I wrote it in here and I don't, I'm not finding it. Where are you? Oh, Kenaz, back on line 14 of page 65, was the father of the Kenizzites. They show up. They're all powerful people, much earlier than Israel is. Uh, Israel does eventually prosper. Israel does eventually conquer the Kenizzites, the Edomites, uh, the Temanites. Uh, Israel eventually owns the whole area, right? But for a long time, it looks like uh, God is slow in keeping his promises. Um, so it's just a little bit that we get out of this uh, passage. So what happened to his uh, his whole kingdom, the whole place of Edom? Eventually, 
is David Oh, David Yeah. So eventually, uh, eventually, David starts a, a war against the Edomites, and he uh, he doesn't fully conquer the Edomites, but his son Solomon finishes the job. So by the time Solomon is king in Israel, Solomon uh, has uh, completely dominated the Edomites, and they cease to be a people, separate from Israel. They get they get uh, merged into the Israelites. Uh, but David actually conquers them sufficiently that he sets up a series of watchtowers throughout little little uh, bases throughout Edomite territory. So he he starts establishing outposts in Edomite territory. It's, but Solomon winds up finishing the job. A um, couple other interesting things about genealogy four. Um, I'll just point these out and we'll we'll scoot through. One thing that's interesting about the gene, this genealogy four is it's not a genealogy. Uh, let's read it here. Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, the name of his city being Dinhaba. He has a, a city that was his capital. Bela died. And Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. He's the son of a different person reigning in a different city as the king of, of Edom. In fact, as you read through this list, none of these guys are related to each other. So Edom had a political structure in which their kings were not um, were not uh, a dynasty, it wasn't a dynastic rulership where father passes on the kingship to their sons. Um, it's not even necessarily somebody in the same city. The king of the Edomites might be someone entirely different. So that's interesting politically. Another interesting thing, as you go back to line 24, Balhanan, the son of Akbor, died. I love Akbor. And, and Hadar reigned in his place, the name of his city being Pau. But we don't know Hadar's father's name, but we do know his wife's name. His wife's name was Mehetabel, the daughter of Matrit, daughter of Mazahab. Uh, somehow, Mehetabel is much more important than his father. Than, than, uh, than her husband's father. Uh, she's got to be a prominent person because we get a little bit of a genealogy for her there. Um, and these are all the products of Edom, of Esau intermarrying with the Canaanites and eventually intermarrying with Canaanite royalty, right? Intermarrying with really prominent families uh, among the, the Canaanites. Um, so we get, as we get to the end of our passage, what we, we find is that um, Esau has moved from having sons to chiefs to kings and has not just had uh, Esau marry a Canaanite, but some of Esau's sons marry a Canaanite, just a few, just a couple. And then eventually they're fully intermarrying with the Canaanites to the point of rising to the highest levels of Canaanite society. And Edom winds up being basically a Canaanite nation. And then we get to the last sentence, which I insist has to be there. Okay. So we finish these four genealogies, and then we find out one last fact about Jacob. I believe this is a contrast between Esau and Jacob. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. We have this movement for Esau. Okay? Esau lives in Canaan. He marries Canaanites And then he uh, leaves for Seir. So Canaan is the promised land. Okay. Esau starts out living in the promised land with his father. When Jacob leaves, he stays. But he marries Canaanites. And eventually he leaves the promised land voluntarily to go outside the promised land. Okay. Jacob. Uh, leaves Canaan, right? 
he marries uh, uh, family. <laughs> he marries uh, within a non canon, right? And then leaves for the promised. Uh, their journeys are almost entirely opposite. Um, Esau stays in Canaan in his early days. Jacob leaves Canaan in his early days. But Jacob is the one who winds up fulfilling his parents' wishes by marrying uh, people who are in the line of God's promise. And he eventually returns to the promised land at the end of his life. Esau stays early, marries badly, and leaves uh, leaves the promised land. Um, Esau's trajectory is going outside, and Jacob's trajectory brings him back inside. Um, and I think that that's the point of the passage. Okay, uh, I, I don't want to. We were looking, listening, living. This is hard stuff to get, so I'm giving it to you. Okay. Um, uh, I think that the point of this passage, one of the points of this passage is um, that, that Esau's journey is out, even though he, God blesses him, even though he forms 12 tribes, even though uh, he's not a bad guy. Esau's journey is out, and Jacob's journey is, is, is a return. There are other themes in this passage, um, but I think that is, is the, the main theme of the passage. As we listen to the passage, could, did you identify any other themes uh, in this passage? So anything else that stood out to you as this, this is probably uh, something that the author was trying to teach us. God fulfilled his promise to both of them. Okay, yeah. So I that's you get a gold star if you say these words in the Genesis Bible study. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's I, I mentioned this in the last class, you know. I, I I sort of feel like part of my job is to razzle dazzle you with scripture, but we keep coming back to the same themes. Why is it that every passage teaches the same theme? Is it because you don't have any creativity, Pastor House? No, no, no that's consistent. It's got yeah, exactly. This is what the just what Genesis is about, right? The whole book is about this. So of course the author keeps coming back to this. God is fulfilling his promise. God made a promise to uh, to Abraham that his descendants would be blessed. God made a promise to Isaac, his descendants would be blessed. Esau is one of Abraham's descendants. Esau is one of Isaac's descendants, right? Um, God, and then Isaac actually made a blessing on Esau. And he said, you will live away from the fat of the land, of the land of Canaan, right? Uh, you will live by the sword, okay? But when you grow tired of your brother's yoke, you will throw it off of your neck. Oh, right. His, his blessing on Esau has been fulfilled. Esau is not under Jacob's yoke. He's free, right? Esau is not a farmer. He's not in Canaan. He's not living off the fat of the land. He is conquering uh, in Canaan, or conquering in Seir, and he is intermarrying in Seir. He's, he's living by the sword, but also by intermarriage. Um, what, what he was blessed by his father was fulfilled. God's promise to Abraham and Isaac is fulfilled. This is a this is a passage that gives us the fulfillment of God's promise, even to Esau. Good. So, I mean, it's spoiler alert, right? If you want to, you want to pick the, the themes of any passage in Genesis, start looking for that. You'll probably see. Well, it's important because 
God's just getting started. Yes. So he sent thousands and thousands of people to teach about this and convince them yes. they have to believe this. Yes. And so, because if the first couple of generations didn't believe it, yes. they go, they're going to let down the rain. Exactly. So God, in, here in Genesis, the whole thing is getting its genesis. It's getting its start, right? Yeah. The beginning of everything. And it's it's the beginning, especially, of the story of God's dealings with his people. And here at the foundation, the thing that God wants us to know more than anything else is that he's a promise-keeping God. He makes promises, and he keeps them. And uh, we'll... He was the original promise. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's a joke that won't work on the next generation, because promise-keepers is almost not even a thing anymore. But yeah, this is this is uh, this is the this is the thing of Genesis is what God wants us to know. He fulfills His promises. He makes His promises. It's good stuff. Um, I don't see any other things. If you got other themes, I'm great. I'm glad to hear. Them, but but those are the two themes I saw uh, here in this chapter. What we did was Genesis chapter 36 today and chapter 37 verse one. I Shanghai verse one and pull it in as I think that it should go with this. I did read uh, in my commentaries, I did read uh, some um, sort of interpretation of this passage that says that, uh, that uh, evil people will prosper faster than good people. Um, I, I wanna be careful with that. Because I don't think Esau was actually fully evil, right? He, he did some bad things, but he winds up coming back. Um, Esau is a complicated character. Um, but I, I think we can say that, uh, that the root to, uh, root to prosperity for God's people may be slow. Right? It may be a slow root of God to prosperity. Prosperity might come your dead to your to your descendants right the, the real fruit of your uh, faithfulness to God you may not enjoy that's what the book of Hebrews tells us is the case for most of the people in the Old Testament right the book of the Hebrews says all these looked forward to the fulfillment of God's promise and they did not see it right um, we in this church, we rag on prosperity gospel teachers with good reason, right? They're heretics. Agreed. Um, but in some ways, they're heretics only because of timing. What they claim is that God will prosper you now in a way you can see. Okay. Um, what the Bible promises is that God will prosper you eventually right and it may be after you've drawn your last breath that's not what the prosperity teachers want to say right because they want they want you to live your as joel osteen's book is is wants you to live your best life now right um but that's not what the bible promises the bible doesn't promise that you'll live your best life now the bible promises that you will prosper eventually but it may be after you die. And it may be that it'll only really show up in your children and grandchildren or great grandchildren. And maybe that's okay. Maybe you've laid a foundation, right? That will last for, uh, that will last beyond what you can see. And I think that's a promise worth hanging on to. But it's a promise that requires faith. That you have to have faith that God will fulfill his promises. And how do we know God will fulfill his promises? Right? Thanks to the book of Genesis. Let's pray. Well, thanks for this time for us to be together tonight. Um, I guess I want to leave some time for you guys to hear from the Lord. What's the Lord want to say to you specifically? Uh, yeah. All right. So back up a little bit. We're, we're still, let's be prayerful. Still be prayerful. Let's take a couple of minutes and just listen to the Lord and ask, okay, Lord, what did you want me to hear tonight? Uh, take two minutes. I'm going to sit down. Take two minutes and listen and, and 
jot down what you feel the Lord is saying to you tonight. All right. So as always, we don't require that anybody share, uh, but if you have something that God has said to you that you'd like to share, um, maybe God said to you, you know, insist that your first grandchild be named us. Um, maybe it's something else. What, what, does anybody have anything that God said to them they want to share? I, yeah, I'll, I'll share. Um, you know, I don't know if it was just tonight. Um, you know, it seems to be that this has happened for a, a few nights now, but I, I think it really hit home tonight. Um, so I'll share it tonight. Um, to me, it, it's not, you know, you, you can read the Bible, right? You, you know, we're, we're, we're hammered with that from the time we're, we're kids, you know, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. It's not, it's not really just a matter of reading the Bible. I mean, there's, you know, I I can't tell you how many times I've I've read these passages, but there's so much more in it than just reading it. You really need to you know spend time with the passages, not just you can't just read it through. It's not enough. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's I'm, I'm delighted that that came out of tonight's study. That's awesome. Um, I you know I. Early on in the class, I, I used this analogy, and I think it's a good one. Um, when I was living in Rochester, New York, we lived on a, a fast-moving road. It was, a, it was a state route. Cars were zipping by. And so we would leave our driveway, and we would you know, immediately turn into traffic and immediately turn as fast as we could get going right away. So we would drive you know, pretty zippy on the road that we were living. So... Um, just if you took a left out of our driveway, just you know, half a mile down the road, there was an intersection. At the intersection was a big M supermarket. And usually I would just drive there. Right? But one day I went and I, I walked there, across the road at my driveway, and I walked to Big M. And I discovered that there was a river, that, a, a stream that ran under the road that I'd never seen before. It went, ran through a culvert. Uh, and it, I mean, clearly when I was walking, I could see you know, the land dropped off, there was a trickle there, a stream, and it, it ran through a culvert underneath the road. I didn't know it um, because I drove so fast by it, I didn't see it. And at, 
right next to the stream, the neighbor whose house uh, was there, they had a tire swing hanging off the tire and uh, off the tree in their side yard. Never seen it before. Um, and I no started noticing all these little details of, of, of the neighborhood I'd been living in for five years, right? Had never noticed because I was driving 45 miles an hour down the road uh, and, and I'd never seen it. Right? When you slow down, when you take your time, there's so much. And even this, I mean, this is not a great passage, but there's even stuff here. Right? Amen. Anybody else? I, I guess I'll share that um, the trajectory that Esau and Jacob follow, I'm taking some encouragement from. Um, you know, I, I have kids who are, uh, my son is 20 and he's off at college. My daughter is 16. She's at home getting ready to go to college. Um, and uh, I'm less nervous about my son because I've seen the choices he's making now that he's on his own. But my daughter hasn't been on her own yet. She hasn't started making choices uh, that are outside of our umbrella. And I'm just terrified about letting her go to college, right? Um, and I don't know what's going to happen uh, when she leaves the house. And uh, I hope she doesn't watch this. But <laughs> I think I'm pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I see two trajectories here, right? I see one who, who did stay home, but made bad choices at home and eventually winds up leaving the promised land. But I see one who left the promised land early, uh, but eventually comes back in a relationship with God. And, you know, you don't know, you don't know what your kids are going to do. I don't know. Kids are going to do, um, but uh, it's been hammered home in my head from time, time and time again over the last couple of years as I'm thinking through my my kids' lives. Um, as long as they're breathing, there's chance of a return, right? And so, as I'm listening to this passage, that's what I'm hearing. As long as they're breathing, there's chance of a return, and uh, I'm not going to give up hope, uh, even if. They seem to go off the reservation for a little while. Uh, I'm not going to give up. I think um, the job of a parent is to give the child a good foundation. Once you give them a good foundation, they come back to that in times of stress, in times of whatever. Right. And certainly, of all the parents, your kids have the best foundation. I mean, every minute of every day. It is constant, constant, constant. Well, Spurgeon's the Bible. So, my, the foundation my kids have, just to be honest, the foundation my kids have is Bible, Star Trek, <laughs> Weird Al Yankovic, right? Well, okay. Board games. This is more Trek, than just Bible, yeah. but I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, we, we're, we're, we are striving to give them a good foundation. And, you know, um, it's up to them what they do with it. That's true. I can tell you when my son went to the uh, boot camp in the Marines, and after boot camp, they have a huge, huge ceremony. It goes on for days. So anyway, we were in Paris Island, and uh, you were allowed to go all over the whole thing. And so he said, oh, I have to show you the chapel, Mom, a beautiful church they have. So I was like, oh, wow. I said, you can go to the church? He said, yeah, I have. I said, that's fantastic. He said, yeah, because if you go to the church, you can sleep with it. <laughs> 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 There you go. Huh? Anything that gets you there. Once you get by hook or by crook, right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's pray. Well, thanks for this passage. Thanks for this evening that we can study together. Thank you so much for the privilege of studying it with one another. Thank you for the fact that every time we look, we can see something new. Um, and thank you that even in the passages that seem like a desert, <laughs> that there is there is some fruit there. So I pray that, Lord, you'd help us in our daily Bible reading to uh, be diligent to look. Um, and I pray that our time together here would fuel our time apart um, and that we would be energized for closer readings of the scripture as we go. 
Uh, Lord, thank you for the encouragement that you keep your promises. Thank you for the encouragement that, uh, that um, you can bring our kids back. Um, and Lord, we, we hold on to those, those promises. We hold on to that hope, Lord, um, for our kids, for our grandkids, for our community, our church, and our country. In Jesus' name. Uh, we will not have Bible study next Wednesday uh, because it's the Thanksgiving Eve. Um, one way or another, I will not be in Poughkeepsie. So I don't know how that's going to work exactly, but I um, want to wish you all a happy Thanksgiving. I guess I'll see you, I'll probably see you guys on Sunday. Probably see you guys on Saturday and then Sunday, right? Potluck and then, and then Sunday. Um, for all of you on YouTube, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I don't know when you'll ever watch this, but Happy whatever next holiday is coming up. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. Mm -hmm.